So we are in the phase of calculus, which is finding derivatives. The way that finding derivatives works is we learn a bunch of base model derivatives, and then we learn about some rules for how we can combine the base models to find the derivative of anything. By the time we're done with the process, there's not a function that we can put together, that anyone can put together, that you can't differentiate given motivation and time. You just have to know your base models and combine and know how they are combined. And so that tells you which rule to apply. It's a very straightforward process. There just seems like a lot to remember, but that's only because there's a lot to remember. You have to remember all of it all the time in perfect detail. Right now, we only have like two base derivatives. A variable raised to a constant exponent and a constant raised to a variable exponent. So we've got those two. Yesterday we talked about where e to the kx comes from, and it comes from, and we base it on our description of how exponential functions rate of change works. The rate of change of an exponential function is proportional to the exponential function. The constant of proportionality is the the natural log of the base. Or we could say it is the uh, the constant of proportionality is the continuous percent increase or decrease. That's our constant of proportionality for an exponential function and its rate of change. All that yesterday is to remember this, the derivative of e to the kx is k e to the kx. So now we can, uh, and we also have the chain rule. So we need to add more rules. There's only two more, and of those we only need one. But we need to add more base derivatives so that we can make more interesting combinations. Not useful combinations, I said interesting combinations. So let's learn some more base derivatives. So we need some base derivatives, then we'll know the three rules. We only know one right now, we only know the chain rule. So let's look at some um, more base derivatives. The derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. I know yesterday I went through a whole thing about coming up with the derivative of e to the kx. But here, derivative of sine is cosine. We're at the part of the game where we're just gonna start listing stuff and then go back and check it out later. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. We're going to want to combine this with the chain rule. And the simplest form is to have the inside be just a k times x. So if we change the argument and have a derivative of, we want the derivative of sine of k times x. That's going to be k times the sine of kx. The derivative with respect to x of cosine of some constant times x is that constant times negative uh, sine. Derivative of sine is not sine. That's that's an e to the x thing.
The derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. You don't have to memorize these. You just have to remember them starting now and forever. The derivative of tangent is secant squared. Derivative of tangent x is secant squared x. Sometimes this is expressed as the derivative of tangent is one over cosine squared. I think that's weird. We invented secant for a whole reason so that we could avoid writing one over cosine, but that's how we will see it sometimes. The derivative of secant is secant tangent. For now, all we got to do is remember these. We just want to remember these for now. We start by remembering them. We'll make them make sense later. But the most important thing is the TLDR. Here's a list of things. Deriving these, we have to know some weird limits. And one of the ways we know those limits is we, we, we just kind of start from here. It just kind of becomes a circular argument. So I just like cut out the middleman. Derivative of sine is cosine. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. Derivative of tangent is secant squared. The derivative of secant is secant tangent. The interesting thing here is that for sine and cosine, notice that their derivatives, we go from a degree one, sine of the first and cosine of the first, to degree one, cosine of the first, negative sine to the first. Degree one, degree one, degree one in a trig function. But for tangent and secant, we go the derivative of a degree one, these are both first powers, is degree two. So the exponent goes from tangent with a degree one to secant squared. And there's two factors down here. So this is degree two. We've got secant and tangent. Not degree in two in terms of polynomial, but degree two in terms of trig functions. So that's one of the interesting things about the sine and cosine pairing and the tangent and secant pairing. Sine and cosine go degree one to degree one. But tangent and secant go from degree one to degree two. That is an interesting thing to happen. There is also derivatives of cotangent and cosecant. But in my usual fashion, I'm going to Game of Thrones these. I'm going to reference that there are derivatives of cotangent, cosecant, and then just never reference it again. I'm going to bring something up. It's like, oh, this could be significant. And then just like never mention it again. Hey, Game of Thrones showrunners, what are you going to do with that scene? Nothing. Just going to have it. So it's tangent to the first power, and then it's degree two. Whereas up here, we had degree one, sine of the first, cosine of the first. 
And here we have secant to the first, and there's two raised to the first power. So we want to be able to use these along with um, our chain rule. Because right now, all we got is a chain rule. We haven't learned product rule yet. Let's suppose that we have the derivative. We want to find the derivative of sine of x cubed. We want to, uh, we're going to be using a chain rule because that's the only one we know right now. So sine and x cubed, we've made a composition of functions. In the order of operations, what's the first thing that happens to the x? Cubed, it gets cubed. The x gets cubed first, and then after we cube it, the second operation is sine. So the first thing that happens to x is cubed. The second thing that happens is sine. So the way we're going to read what's going on here in the style that we did yesterday, x cubed is inside. And then the outside function is sine x. So reading this derivative, I want the derivative of sine of something. The derivative of sine of a thing is cosine of that thing times the derivative of that thing. So the derivative of sine of a thing is cosine of that thing, just as it is, times the derivative of that thing. This would be a weird way to write this function. I've got a monomial multiplied by this cosine. So the normal thing to do would be to write the three X squared first. The natural follow-up to this example is to, we have two operations. First, we do the cube. Second, we do the sine. All I'm going to do with the next one is reverse the order of those operations. I'm going to write a function that first we do the sine and second we do the cube. We have a funky way to write that. When we write sine cubed x, we mean first do sine of x and then cube it. So if we want to read this, this is the derivative of sine of x cubed. We just have a different notation for a power of a trig function. So when we see sine cubed of x, we still see the same two operations, a cube and a sine, but they go in the other order. First, we do the sine, then we do the cube. So our inside, in, in this case, is sine x. And our outside function is something to the third power. So our derivative will be three times thing to the second power times the derivative of the thing. And 
then the derivative of sine is cosine. This would be a weird way to write it because there's so many parentheses going on, but we want to make clear what we mean when we write sine to the third x, because that's how we say it. We say sine to the third x. And what we mean is the third power of the sine of x. But what we would write for an answer is three sine squared times cosine. And in casual conversation, we usually live, leave off the of x part, which causes some of us to stop writing the of x part and just writing sine, because that's all we do is we say sine. But just writing sine by itself doesn't mean anything. We haven't said a whole sentence. If all we write is sine, See how that was incomplete? That's what happens if you just write sign. It's incomplete. You haven't finished the thought. You left everybody sitting there in anticipation. Any questions? It's a reading exercise. You got to know your order of operations. And you don't get to use PEMDAS because where is S, C, T, and the other S in PEMDAS? It's not the S at the end. PEMDAS is track. Now that I have lots of functions, I can just start barfing them all into one function. Yeah. A lot going on in this function. There are three, I see three functions going on in this function that matter as far as derivatives go. What are the things that happen that, that derivatives are gonna care about? And what are the two things that happen in this function that the derivatives aren't going to care about? What are three things that the derivative is going to care about? What are those three operations that we see? What do you see? A cosine, an e to the something, and an x squared. Those are the three functions that derivative is going to care about. What are the two functions that derivative does not care about in this function? Five times five and times three. The derivative respects scalar multiplication. The derivative says, if you want to be three times that function, just hold the three and I'll take the derivative of the function. No problem. The derivative will respect it, multiplying by five and multiplying by three. The derivative respects scalar multiplication. The ones that we, that we care about are the x squared, the e to the x, and the cosine of x. Those are the three functions we're gonna have to take derivatives of. Now I've stacked up a chain rule because I've got three stacked up in one function, so a composition of three functions. What's the most inside function? What's the first thing that happens to the x? x squared, that's the most inside function. What's the middle function? e, e to the stuff, that's the Malcolm function. And what is the last function that happens? Cosine. So what's the first derivative we're gonna find? Cosine, we always start from the outside, the derivative of the outside with respect to the inside, multiply by the derivative of the inside. When we get to the inside, it's gonna be the derivative of the outside with respect to the middle function, multiply by the derivative of the middle function, the derivative of the middle function with respect to the inner function, multiplied by the inner function. 
So think about the order of operations that happens here. First, we do x squared. I'm going to use my normal notation. Even though this is not the algebra class, not an algebra class, I'm going to use my algebra class notation. The things that happen to the x, first, we raise the second power. Second, we did an e to the stuff. And then third, we did some cosine of some stuff. There was a times three and a times five mixed in there. We don't care about that as far as the derivative goes. So the first thing that we're going to do, the way we're going to read this function, this is the derivative. We want the derivative of five times the cosine of some stuff. That's the first thing that we come across. That's our outer function. So for f prime, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Five is just being carried along. Then the chain rule says multiply by the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of five times some stuff is negative five times the sine of that stuff times the derivative of that stuff. So now I'm doing the derivative of e to three e to the x squared. The derivative of 3e e to the x squared. The derivative of 3e e to the stuff is 3e e to that stuff times the derivative of that stuff. And there it is. Chain rule with three things. This worked out because the x only appeared one time. So we could just stack up what happened to the x. One thing happened to the x. If multiple things happen to the x, then it might be a little bit um, more confusing. We might not be able to stack things as easily. So we have to adjust our vision for those things. But then we have then it becomes our we have, we just have to learn the judgment of when that matters. So for example, capital F of X is five times the cosine of three E to the um, X squared minus four X plus one. Now it's a little bit messier. I can't just say the first thing that happens is X gets squared. The first thing that happens is that x goes into this quadratic thing. So that x squared minus 4x plus 1, that's all the exponent in the e. So the, that's the first thing that happens. So if I was going to make a notation, first, be, first I'd be like all the quadratic stuff. And then we make that the power of E. And third, we cosine. Cosine the trig function, not cosine alone. Never cosine alone. Never do that. No. So our derivative, F prime, is the same thing. Five is just going to follow along. The derivative of cosine of something is minus sine of that thing.
times the derivative of that thing. The derivative of 3e to the something is 3e to the something times the derivative of the something. Writing it this way looks terrible, but it lays everything out the way that we're thinking about it. So each of these could stand some cleanup. That's awfully lazy of me. In this first one, notice that I've really got the sine factor, I've got the e to the x factor, and this x factor, and I've got a negative five, a three, and a two. I've got all this stuff is being multiplied together. So I'm just going to gather my constants. Negative five, three, and two is negative 30. I've got a factor of x. I like my monomials to be written first. I've got an e to the x squared and a sign. I like my exponentials to go in front of my trig functions. That might be a little cleaner version of things. In this second one, I've got this polynomial business, I've got some exponential business, and I got some trigonometric business. And I want to write those in the same order. And I also want to gather up all my constants. I got the negative three, sorry, I got the negative five, I got the three. And this is a two X minus four. I can pull a two out of that. So I might write this as negative 15 and then keep the, the polynomial part by itself. Still write my exponential part next and follow that up with my trigonometric stuff. But what we might do is get our polynomial down to just factors. And so I can have constant polynomial exponential trig. So this might get simplified pull a two out of the here and get this uh, negative 30 times an X minus four, sorry, minus two. This by the way is why we don't wanna simplify a lot of stuff if we don't have to. Which one you want to write depends on what you happen to be doing at the time. If it's a problem that you're doing for me, then you're gonna to want to do what I say you need to do. In the beginning, I am going to say, don't bother simplifying your stuff. Only partially because I don't trust you to do the algebra to simplify your stuff. Also, you haven't been simplifying stuff enough to like be indoctrinated or I mean trained in the way that we normally do things in math. Plus, I want to see that you step, how you stack up your functions. I want to see your thinking. Writing them in this order shows me how you were thinking about your chain rule. Does that make sense? It shows, it just, it very much lays out how you were thinking when you did this chain rule. And that's what I want to see. 
I'm not allowed to read your minds directly. I have to read your minds through what you write. So I would want this first one for now, since we're training, and that's the thing that we're practicing. And we have to keep practicing until we get to the point where you're like, oh, ugh, why do I have to keep doing this? That's when you just started the assignment, just, just to let you know. When you're doing the problems one through a thousand for practice, and you get to the point where you start questioning why you are having to do this. Why is that jerk leech making me do these 50 problems? That's when the assignment has started. However long it took you to get to that point, once you start getting sick of it, that's when the assignment starts. Even if that's like an hour into doing the problems. You know what I mean? And if it's an hour into doing the problems, you need to stop. So whenever you sit down to do math, and I haven't mentioned this one before, partially because we when we try to sit down to do math, Wiley Plus says, you need to register. And we're like, oh, no, fuck you, Wiley Plus. But once that's sorted out and you sit down to do math, once you've been doing math for an hour, stop. You have to stop. Walk away and go do something else. Preferably something that's easy on your mind, like watch TV, take a nap, just sit and stare at the wall. Stop doing math. Whatever it takes to make you stop doing math, stop. Wait at least 50 minutes to a half hour, somewhere in there. Then you can sit down and do it again. And an hour is pushing it. My recommendation is 45 minutes on, 15 minutes off. If you can do that twice, that is a lot of work in one day. Here's what we want to compare it to. I don't know if you go to the gym. Obviously, I don't, but I've heard people do it. So if you go to the gym, and skip the gym for Monday through, through through Thursday. Can you just work out for 10 hours straight on Friday? Is that how it works? Can you just make up the time? No, you'll get hurt, right? Same thing is true doing that. You just pull a different muscle group. At a certain point, if you try to work out for 10 hours, you're, go you're, you're going to be stopped from doing that. There's no amount of determination that will make you physically push through that kind of work. It is just not going to work. It's not going to happen. So don't expect the same. The, don't don't expect anything different when it comes to math. Just because you're not like your muscles aren't getting tired. Does that make sense? There are certain physical things that happen when you're doing math, and one of those things is you fucking get tired. So just stop. Let it go. If you sit down after 15 minutes and you can't put things together, then you're done for the day. I don't care if you're done with your problem set or not, you're done for the day. That's it. Any questions? How's that okay? Like the worst thing that happens is I get emails and say, oh man, I've been working on this assignment for four hours. I'm like, oh, dude, why are you fucking emailing me now? You are three hours late for emailing me a question. That should have happened three hours ago. Okay. All right. So this was some stacked chain rule we learned. We only got to practice with, oh, with a couple of them, but we learned some more basic derivatives. Notice we have now one, two, three, four, five, six base derivatives, plus two DVD bonus material ones. These are going to get cut. You're only going to see these in the director's cut, so don't worry about those too much. But these these six right here, mm, you got to know those. You have until now to know those from now until forever. That's it for today. I will see you all on tomorrow. Everybody have a good day, and thanks for playing.